Well, folks, uh, welcome back to the second day for the uh, conference. Uh, today we have Professor Edward Jafal from uh, Purdue University. He's going to be talking about his uh, approach to contextuality, called contextuality by default. And I think this is version 2.0. It's bad there, right? Um, Eddie is well known to all of you. Pat. Welcome, Eddie. Thanks for coming here. We appreciate your. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here, definitely. It's a great conference. I hope that it will continue in years to come. Um, so, uh, this is indeed uh, a particular approach to the problem of contextuality. Uh, and uh, it is a revision with respect to most of our publications, and therefore I'm calling it 2.0, provisional, for, for the purposes of this talk, and also the paper that will appear in the form of the proceedings. Uh, my collaborator, uh, Jan Aquila, is uh, co-author of both the paper and also the talk. Uh, so, uh, with gratitude to a variety of people, and more specifically to the Oxford group led by Samson Abramsky, with whom it seems that we have found a lot of things in common, and in fact uh, managed to find some way of translating his language into mine, and vice versa. With my gratitude to our gracious host, Acacio, and uh, his collaborator, Gary Oost, by the way, he's not here for whatever reason, right? It's coming in the afternoon. Oh, okay. Uh, so we, not only I was invited by Acacio, but we have also collaborated and uh, co-authored some, some publications together. And finally, with gratitude to my students, Rujang and Victor C uh, Cervantes. Uh, Victor, unfortunately, could not come. He is in Colombia. And uh, uh, I will be later giving a talk that Victor was supposed to give. It is a closer talk, so kind of it's legitimate, although it's very pity that he's not here. Uh, so, the outlines of my talk, I will talk about what the traditional understanding of contextuality is and why it leads to a true paradox what the contextuality by default theory is, how it corrects the traditional understanding and generalizes it to arbitrary systems of measurements. And uh, I will talk about some properties, the most basic properties of the uh, contextuality in accordance with the approach. Uh, and uh, finally, I will also introduce a universal measure of contextuality, universal simply means applicable to arbitrary systems. Okay, so origins of the contextuality problem, you know, we have already heard the term, the word contextuality yesterday repeatedly many, many times, but it's just a word, it's being used in a variety of different meanings, and in order to use it in a disciplined way, uh, it is important to, uh, to narrow the, uh, the content of the meaning and also uh, the relation to the historical uses of this term. The way I'm using this term is in relation to two lines of investigation. In quantum physics, uh, the term contextuality was introduced uh, by, uh, by Spepper and then uh, uh, kind of enshrined in Koch and Specker theorem and their uh, joint publication. Uh, and uh, it involves such uh, systems as uh, Klatschko, Jan Benjoglu, Shomovsky system, uh, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen system uh, adapted to spin measurements by Bohm and Bell. And finally, by the Leger drug system, which uh, in formal, in, in formal way was investigated before them by Supus and Zanotti. Uh, all of these systems are very different uh, from physical point of view, and there is a different terminology associated with these systems, but all, all of them can be analyzed and discussed in terms of contextuality. 
Uh, and uh, there is another line of research uh, in psychology, and uh, it involves uh, the classical problem of selective influences as proposed and in, introduced in 1969 by Salzburg Sternberg. Uh, then uh, the question order effects, it's, uh, it's another uh, uh, kind of uh, important area of application. And then, and there is, uh, well, it's actually a nice movie. Uh, uh, and there were several attempts, it is probably not, not right to call them origins of the contextuality problem, but uh, several attempts to imitate quantum mechanical designs in behavioral sciences, and uh, those also can be and sometimes are discussed in terms of contextuality. Now, contextuality by default is a particular approach. It generalizes traditional understanding of contextuality, uh, uh, and I will explain exactly in what ways it generalizes it. And also, it generalizes the theory of selective influences in psychology. And this is how I came into this problem, from selective influences. This was my domain uh, beginning here from uh, early uh, 2000s. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I worked in this area without being uh, aware of uh, anything similar being done in quantum mechanics until much later. Um, now, in, uh, in the revised version of contextuality by default, the revision it's itself is relatively subtle and technical and probably will be uh, clear only to people who actually worked with me, like uh, Acacia. Uh, but I will, I will point out that specific uh, issue where, where the theory was revised with respect to most of our publications. But uh, contextuality by default as it stands now, it generalizes uh, our work in, uh, in quantum physics, specifically our work in so-called cyclic systems. It's based uh, primarily on these three publications. And uh, it also uh, generalizes our work in cyclic systems in psychology, uh, mostly represented in these two publications. And uh, the theory itself is incompletely presented in three publications, one of which uh, is uh, to appear in the tome of the proceedings of this conference, and two others are being compressed. So this it is a recent development, and these three publications, more or less, is what the foundation of my present talk is. Now, uh, let me begin with an example, uh, almost arbitrarily chosen. I just wanted to, to choose an example that would not be a cyclic system, and at the same time will be simple to analyze. So let's say you have four properties. Now, in physics, we will say measure. And uh, in psychology, we will say responded to. So in psychology, Q1 through Q4 would be questions of stimuli presented to to, uh, to a subject, and the subject will respond to them. In quantum physics, this would be some physical properties, such as spins along various <coughs> axes, and they are measured. But uh, in, spite, in spite of this difference in terminology, the treatment is exactly the same mathematically. Suppose that they can be measured or responded to only, uh, only in triples, uh, three at a time. So I can measure Q1, Q2, and Q4 together, or I can measure Q1, Q2, Q3 together, or else I can measure Q2, Q3, and Q4 together. So I never can measure all four of them, but I can measure these particular triples of, the, uh, of these properties. And outcome of each measurement of each of these properties is a random variable. And uh, the traditional uh, formulation of the problem of contextuality is here. Can all of these random variables, well in our case, we will see that the term all actually is, is not very well defined. But, uh, uh, whatever random variables we will have here, can all of these random variables be presented as functions of a single random variable, which sometimes is referred to as a hidden one? This is the classical formulation, for example, used by 
John Bell himself. Much later, it became clear in uh, quantum physics that there is a very simple theorem that says that the dependence of or representability of all random variables as functions of one and the same random variables is the same thing as the existence of a joint distribution of this random variable. So in other words, instead of saying, can all of these random variables be presented as functions of a hidden one, I can also ask, can all of these random variables be imposed a joint distribution upon? Now, imposed joint distribution upon is a more correct way of saying it than uh, whether they are jointly distributed, and we will see why. Although in the traditional understanding, sometimes you can see formulation in there, uh, some variants of this formulation. Now let's uh, let's try to see what it means uh, in uh, uh, kind of in greater detail. So let's assume that uh, these are your properties, and the context C1, C2, C3 are the properties are defined by the properties measured together. So. Uh, in my two example, you have three contexts for properties. And uh, let's assume that the random variable is defined by what property it measures. What? It means that you have R1, R2, R3, three uh, random variables in context 1, and R2, 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 uh, R1, R2, R3 in context 2. And as you see, the two contexts share some of the random variables. So, in this formulation, from the very beginning, from the outset, without discussing this, the two sets of random variables are overlapping. And uh, as you can see, any two of the three are overlapping here. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the situation is here is such that since R1, R2, R4 are measured within a single context together, in some well-defined empirical sense. For example, simultaneously, or in a succession in a given experiment, or in, in psychology it could be that they are answers given by one and the same subject to the three questions. So there can be various empirical meanings of togetherness, but whatever this meaning can be, they are jointly distributed, and therefore this triple of random variables is in fact a random variable in its own right, with its own distribution. This is another random variable, a third random variable. So we have three random variables, or three triples of random variables, which means that there is a distribution, joint distribution of R1, R2, R4. DI here simply stands for distribution. You have a distribution of R1, R2, R3. You have a joint distribution of R2, R3, R4. And you are asking the question, is there a joint distribution of all four of them? Now, in this formulation, there are only four random variables in play. So you have to ask this question now. Is it uh, possible that these three joint distributions exist and well-defined, whereas this, random, this distribution does not exist? Well, on the surface of it, it is very easy to see that the answer is affirmative. For example, let's assume that R2 in all three triplets is independent of the rest of the random variables in each of the joint distributions. And the probabilities, uh, let's, let's assume that all these random variables, all four of them, are Bernoulli, so they are 0, 1 random variables, and uh, 0 and 1 occur with probability of 0.5 or 0.5 each, so uniform Bernoulli. And uh, then uh, the, the distribution is uniquely characterized by this, uh, R1 is not equal to R4 with this probability, R1 is not equal to R3 with this probability, and R3 and R4 are not equal with this probability. Now, it is very easy to figure out and to show that there is no joint distribution of the four random variables R1, R2, R3, R4 that would satisfy these this three distributions as marginal. So we'd have these three distributions as marginal distributions. And uh, uh, if I put here, by the way, 1 instead of uh, 0.8, it would be the classical example with which contextuality research started by Cochin, with three so-called magic boxes, where the things are perfectly anti-correlated and they cannot be compatible. Uh, but I kind of, I decided to, to change the 
the formulation in order to show that it doesn't have to be one or zero in order for it not, not to exist. Okay, so uh, we have this situation and it looks very simple. Why not? You have kind of partial distributions, uh, but there is no overall distribution. Uh, in Samson's language or shift theory language, there are local sections and there is no global section. Uh, is it possible, really? Well, there is a problem here. And the problem uh, is very severe. And the problem is that we are talking about joint distributions in classical terms, meaning that joint distribution of random variables is a well-defined concept insofar as I'm sticking to particular theory of probability, and this theory of probability is Kolmogorov's classical probability theory. Only within this framework, all these terms that I've just been using, uh, just uh, used, random variable, joint distribution, existence of joint distribution, have well-defined meanings. And within classical probability theory, it is simply impossible that the situation like this can arise. Let me show it why. Random variable in classical probability theory, let's say x, is defined as a function from one set, domain set, to another set, codomain set, where domain and codomain sets uh, belong to these spaces. This is a probability space. So in the domain space, you have also a set of events, so-called measurable subsets and also a probability measure that allows you to assign a number that you interpret as probability to each of the elements of the sigma algebra. And the codomain is a measurable set where you have uh, the set itself and, and uh, some sigma algebra of measurable events within it. Uh, and uh, the mapping is such that uh, if you take any element of this uh, sigma algebra and map it, map, map it back into the domain set, then the result belongs to the sigma algebra in the domain. So that's what the definition of a measurable function is. And because of that, this thing here belongs to the domain, uh, to the sigma algebra in the domain. It has a well-defined probability. And this probability is interpreted as the probability of the random variable x falling within the set A in its codomain, right? So let's uh, do a bit of an old-fashioned writing here. So if we have one set, another set, this is, uh, this is domain and this is codomain, so I'm mapping from here to here. So now I choose here some subset and I say, well, this is a measurable subset, so it's an event. And I can ask what, if with what probability x falls within this thing. The answer is I map it back into some other set, into, into a set in, uh, within, the, uh, within the domain set. And it is a measurable set, so it has certain measure mu. And this measure mu is the probability with which x falls within this set. Right? Now, this is kind of uh, classical definition of probability of, of a random variable, you can get around it or whatever, but if you deviate from that, you will get in trouble. Now, <coughs> um, if you have two random variables, then each of them is defined analogously, right? The two random variables are identical, they are always equal to each other, uh, if and only if they have the same domain spaces and the same codomain spaces and also the same measurable functions. So they are identical in all components. Then and only then it's one and the same random variable. Two random variables have the same distribution if and only if their codomain spaces are the same and also they satisfy this property that for one and the same A in the common codomain space if you map them back the, uh, the respective uh, probability measures in the different, possibly different domain spaces are equal to each other. And then we say that they have the same distribution. And finally, and this is most important for our considerations, two random variables are jointly distributed, which is presented here in the following way, that the two random variables can be considered as a single random variable z. 
they are jointly distributed if and only if they have the same domain space. If they have the same domain space, then I can take A in the codomain space of X, B in the codomain space of Y. And, uh, and I can map A back into this joint or common domain space. And B I can also map into the same domain space. So there will be two sets in the same domain space. They will overlap or will not overlap as a special case. And this overlap also, because it's a sigma algebra, belong to the domain space, to, to the domain sigma algebra. And it will have a measure mu here. And this measure mu will be now interpreted as the joint probability of x falling in A and y falling in B. This is the only way of doing it. If you do not assume that these domain spaces are the same, you will always have some A and B for which joint distribution will not be, joint probability will not be defined. So, let's return back to the traditional understanding of context shell. Our example, these three distributions exist, overall distribution does not exist. Well, these three random variables are defined, uh, are jointly distributed, so they should be defined on one and the same domain space. These three are jointly distributed. They have to be defined on the same domain space. And the same here, right? So you have three domain spaces here, not four. But then you are looking at this and you are saying that R1 and R1 is one and the same random variable. One and the same random variable cannot be defined on two different domain spaces. It should be one and the same. So this is the same as this. Now these two are defined, it is one and the same random variable, so it should be defined on the same domain space, right? So it is sufficient, in fact, to determine that all random variables in play here should be defined on one and the same domain space, simply by construction. There is no other way of doing it. Therefore, they are jointly distributed for any A1, A2, A3, A4, taken in the codomains of R1, R2, R3, and R4, respectively, I can map them back into the common domain space uh, and uh, take their intersection, compute the measure, common measure mu for them, and this would be the joint probability of X1 following, uh, R1 following in A1, R2 following in A2, and so on, right? So they are jointly distributed we have a true paradox. It is not a mistake in reasoning, or at least not an obvious mistake in reasoning. It's a true paradox. It cannot be done in this way. So the traditional understanding of contextuality is flawed from a mathematical point of view. Well, in fact, uh, what I've just said would apply always if you construct a graph of the context where you will connect the context if and only if they share a random variable. And then if within this graph, you have a path that, that involves all contexts, then the, the result that I've just stipulated applies. Well, in this case, it is, this path is so-called Hamiltonian cycle. So it is, the, uh, it is the classical situation that arises in dealings with context shell. OK, so there is a paradox. And paradox should be resolved. Well, how do we resolve paradoxes? We'll go back and try to find hidden assumptions that would have made that actually led to the contradiction. Well, the hidden assumption that we made cannot be that these things are jointly distributed, because they are jointly distributed, it's an empirical fact. Right? These three are jointly distributed as an empirical fact. These three are jointly distributed as an empirical fact. And the fact that I, the joint distributions can be of a particular kind also very easy to justify, right? I, I construct it in this way, right? It's my example. Well, because we're not talking about real nature. We're talking about the possibility of constructing something, right? I construct it in this way. Well, by Ritub said absurdum, the only culprit here is the assumption that the random variable measuring one and the same property in different contexts is one and the same random variable. This is the wrong assumption. Random variables measuring things in different contexts must be general 
must be, not just can be, must be different random variables. Different random variables. If you don't do that, you will run into paradox. So it means that for every context, for every context and for every content or for every property being measured, there is this one and only one random variable. So context is part of the identity of the random variable in the same way in which the content being measured is. Right? We are not asking why this random variable is different from this. Well, they are measuring different things. In the same way, we should not ask why this is different from this. They are measuring them in different contexts. Context is part of the identity. Part of the identity. Hence, the, the term uh, contextuality by default. There is nothing here to explain. It's not something that, that you have to explain why is it that they are different. They are different by default. This is the definition of a random variable. Every random variable should be defined in this way. Now, in this way, we can uh, kind of proceed more or less as we did before. You have three random variables jointly distributed, three random variables jointly distributed, three jointly distributed, so we have these distributions well defined, but there is no overlap any longer between the sets of random variables being jointly distributed. Moreover, what we have now, we have now so-called connections. Connection is the set of random variables measuring one and the same property in different contexts. So this is one connection, this is second connection, third and fourth connection. Now, this one, these connections are no longer random variables because there is no joint distribution of this and this. They occur in different contexts. They never co-occur in any empirical sense of the word. Not in the empirical sense of the word in which this co-occurs with this. Right? They are measured together. These two things cannot be measured together by definition of context. Because you are if you are measuring in one context, you are not measuring in another context. They are mutually exclusive. So the main principle of contextuality by default, two measurements, have a joint distribution if and only if they share a context. It means that all measurements within a given context are jointly distributed. Any measurements from two different contexts are not jointly distributed. And this, uh, the term that I'm using for that is stochastically unrelated. They are not independent, because independence is a form of joint distribution. They are stochastically unrelated. The notion of a joint probability does not apply to them. In particular, the measurements of the same content in all contexts in which it is measured, so the connection, uh, are all pairwise stochastically unrelated. Pairwise stochastically unrelated. So, does it mean that we simply have to stop here and say, well, everything is contextual? No. That is only the beginning, the kind of the initial setup, conceptual setup that allows us to proceed and do contextuality analysis. Now, contextuality analysis applies to the systems of measurements like this. And uh, some of these systems will be contextual, some of them will not be contextual, depending on the following. Depending on what kind of joint distributions can be, in principle, imposed upon them. If you take a, a set of random variables that are jointly distributed, so all these random variables now are jointly distributed, so it is a single random variable actually here, in such a way that this marginal is distributed in the same way as this marginal, uh, as this triple, this marginal is distributed in the same way as this triple, and this marginal is distributed in the same way as this triple, then we have constructed a coupling for the original system. We have a system. This system is not overall jointly distributed. It doesn't have a joint distribution, so it is not a random variable. But we find the random variable with this property, and this is called coupling in probabilities here. Right? There are other meanings of couplings, obviously. And uh, this is a very specific one, probabilistic coupling. Now, uh, the coupling, by the virtue of being jointly distributed, coupling also imposes joint distributions on the connection. So this R11 and R21, 
So measurements of, of the property one in two different contexts now translates into these two random variables. And these two random variables now are jointly distributed because the whole thing is jointly distributed. Right? So we impose now joint distribution on the things that originally are not jointly distributed. And let's return to, to the traditional understanding and correct it in such a way that everything that's achieved within the area of traditional contextuality analysis preserved, it's simply now presented rigorously. Let's define a system being consistently connected if any two random variables measuring one and the same property in different contexts are identically distributed. Now remember, being identically distributed has nothing to do with being the same random variable. They are just having the same distribution. Not only aren't, aren't they the same random variable, but they are not even jointly distributed. But the distribution here and distribution here is the same. It's per perfectly possible. And then the system is called consistently connected. Traditional contextuality analysis is confined to consistently connected systems. And then we can simply say that in traditional contextuality analysis, a consistently connected system here is non-contextual if I can find a coupling for it such that any two random variables within the couplings measuring one and the same property are equal to each other with probability one. So you see, I didn't assume from the very beginning that it's the same random variable. I'm now asking whether it is possible to impose a coupling such that the things that measure one and the same property are equal to each other with probability one. Therefore, I avoid all paradoxes, all contradictions, but if the answer to this question is affirmative, I have a non-contextual system in the traditional meaning of the word. If it is not possible, so such a coupling does not exist, then the system is contextual. The adjective completely, I will not get into it as a bit technical. Uh, now, the system does not have to be uh, consistently connected. Uh, one, of the, one of the advantages of being, doing things rigorously is not just that you know, we have the intellectual satisfaction of not uh, running into paradoxes, but also that it offers you ways of generalizations that are not open in before, uh, before this particular uh, refinement is made. With the, uh, with the non-contextual notation of the random variables, this generalization about which I will be talking about is not possible. This is so-called inconsistently connected system. Well, the classical example would be legged guard system. You have three measurements made at three points in time with respect to some zero preparation time. And uh, uh, you can make this measurement only two at a time. So you can make this measurement Q1, Q2, or Q1, Q3, or Q2, Q3. Right? But not all of them. Well, it's one, one variant of presenting labor curve systems. Now, uh, it is very well known that if uh, the measurements uh, you know, obey here just the standard projective operator rules, uh, then if you measure Q2 after Q1, then the state here will change because of the measurement at Q1, and the result of the measurement in Q2 will be different. Well, better to say, distribution of the results at Q2 may very well be different from the situation when Q2 is first and then followed by Q3. Because if Q2 is first, then there is only unitary evolution from zero to here that, that, that determines the state here. When Q1 precedes Q2, then it is the measurement here that determines which the state, which state will be here, and then unitary evolution from here to here. Right? So we have a very clear quantum mechanical example whereby the laws of quantum mechanics we have to have inconsistent connectedness in general. There is one special case, perfectly balanced density matrix, when this will not happen. So the distributions will be always the same. But in, in general, the distributions will change. So does it mean that here we cannot speak about contextuality? It would be quite unsatisfactory if it were the case. Uh, now, uh, you can say that the fact that Q, Q1 kind of changes something about measurement of Q2 is already a form of contextuality. Yes, you can say that. 
but it's better to separate it from the meaning of contextuality used in quantum physics. For example, suppose that you have input and output, right? So you have input influencing output, which is a random variable. Do you speak about uh, a, a context here? Well, normally not, right? It's input-output relationship. What if you have two inputs influencing one and the same random variable? Do you normally speak about uh, context here? Well, normally not. You know, input one and input two both influence this output, maybe to a different degree. But if you say that output is the response to input one, then it is tempting to say that input two creates a context for this. So in this sense, we have uh, inconsistent connectedness is also a form of contextual in that sense. But this situation is not different from this, and is not in, uh, kind of essentially different from this. Right? So it is better to separate it and not to call it contextuality. Or call it alpha contextuality, and the contextuality proper will be different one. Right? Okay, uh, this is the example, you know, classical example of contextuality that has nothing to do with uh, uh, consistency or inconsistency of connectedness. Is this a pure bomb bell uh, situation, right? Uh, in this situation, if the if the two measurements are uh, are space-like separated, then uh, you know no physical influence is possible uh, by the laws of special relativity. But uh, at the same time, we know that the identity with with particular choice of this axis of measurement, identity of the measurement along this axis by Alice will depend on which of the two axes was chosen by Bob. Not because of physical influence, right? but because the context has changed. Right? And in this situation, there is contextuality that has nothing to do with, with consistency of connectedness, or inconsistency of connectedness. Now, if they are time-like separated, and there is a possibility of signaling between the two, and let's say there is a small amount of signaling, would it immediately eliminate contextuality in the traditional sense of the word? No it would be better to work it in. So to be able to, to define contextuality even if the connectedness is inconsistent. Uh, the uh, uh, KCBS Klachko uh, Janbinijo Glushomovsky system is here. I will skip it just in order not to get into technical details. Um, so what is the generalized definition of contextuality? The generalized definition of contextuality is that the system is non-contextual if it has a coupling S in which any two random variables measuring one and the same property in different contexts are equal to each other with maximal possible probability, right? So remember, in consistent connectedness, we said with probability one. And now we say with maximal possible probability. And this generalization is very uh, natural because if the, if the distributions of these two random variables are the same, then the maximum possible probability with which they are equal is one. If the distributions are not the same, then the maximum possible probability is strictly less than one. And uh, uh, if such a coupling does not exist, the system is contextual. Let me, so it means that uh, I am looking for the coupling such that these two are equal to each other with the maximum possible probability. These two, these two, these two, and so on, right? Any two of them within columns are equal to each other with maximum possible probability. If, can, if I can find such a coupling, then there is no contextuality. If I cannot, there is a contextuality. Uh, the reason for this is intuitively, it's very simple, right? Uh, if you, if you take this column separately, you can always couple these two in such a way that they are equal to each other with maximum possible probability. You can always couple these three in such a way that these two are equal to each other with maximum possible probability, these two and these two and so on. But then when you put them together, the only thing that happens is that now these, these joint distributions imposed on the columns interfere with the context with the distributions that we observe empirically along the rows. And if this interference is such that it prohibits, so they are incompatible, these maximal things along the columns, incompatible with the empirical things along the rows, 
then it is contextual influence. Context prevents this from happening, and so the, the terminology is quite intuitive, appropriate. This is a cyclic system of binary random variables. A uh, cyclic system is defined as a system in which in every context you have two random variables and every property is being measured in two contexts. And then they can be arranged in this particular way and each of these random variables is binary. In physics usually we say plus one, minus one. Outside physics is zero, one. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if I can say one, two, right? So uh, this is a cyclic system of rank n, meaning that it has n contexts and n properties being measured. Uh, they are always equal to each other in a cyclic system. And uh, every cyclic system can be presented in the form of such a circle in which you know, the two of them would be, the, these two random variables will be joined by the fact that, that they measure one and the same things, and these two will be joined by the, uh, by the virtue of being in the same context. So this, this would be such a cycle or circle. Now, uh, when n equals 5, we have this uh, klatschko jan benigio glushimovsky system. When equals, n equals 4, we have EPR bohm bell system. n equals 3, it is legged garg system, but supersons are not investigated before them, and much better way. Uh, so, uh, and n equal 2, it is the question of the effect. So it's the one example outside of this. Uh, each of these uh, uh, lower rank uh, cyclic system is a proper special case of the of the one of higher rank. So in other words, you can always consider EPRDB system as a special case of KCBS system <coughs> and Leggett Garg system as a special case of EPR system and so on. Uh, now, uh, there is a theorem that says that a cyclic system of binary random variables is completely non-contextual. Actually, in this particular case, uh, completely I'm sorry to say it's completely wrong, so you know, ignore this uh, adjective. <coughs> In fact, it should be partial. Uh, but, uh, but the terminology I'm using for this talk is simply non-contextual, so just ignore this, this adjective altogether. Variable is non-contextual if and only if certain inequality is satisfied. Now, if this, uh, if you can see here that these expected values are, uh, you know, for plus plus minus one random variables, expected values are uh, zeros if, they, if the probabilities are plus one minus one are the same, and otherwise they are some other numbers. And if the connectedness is consistent, so the, the things that measure one and the same, uh, the random variables measuring one and the same property in different contexts, if they are the same, then this, these differences will be all zeros. So this part will disappear, and the inequality will be just this uh, particular linear combination of the, of the expected values of the product being less than or equal to n minus 2. If n is 4, you will get uh, Bell's inequalities, or CHSH inequalities, or Arthur Fine's inequalities. If n is 3, you will get Supersanote legged Garg inequality. Uh, if n equals Five, you will get the inequality that generalizes the uh, the uh, klatschko jan benigio glushimovsky inequality, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, <coughs> Ruzhang today will present the investigation of psychological systems of rank six and eight, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, in Victor Cervantes' talk, we also have higher order systems. But in, in quantum physics, actually, to the best of my knowledge, there was never investigation of of a uh, cyclic system above five. So uh, KCBS is the highest rank of cyclic system, right? I think there are some, some chain building inequalities. Oh, chains were different, but chains are not cyclic systems. So no, no, I mean, it's called chain, but it's basically like close and uh, Okay, that might be a terminological thing, but we can get to that. It doesn't matter. Uh, so let me let me just illustrate the, the analysis of contextuality using the the cyclic system of rank three, so it is like a guard or super zanotti system. So you have three properties measured two at a time, and uh, so you have three contexts, and as a result you have six random variables in play with contextual notation. These two are jointly distributed, these two are jointly distributed, these two are jointly distributed, 
In the jargon that we have developed, we call them bunches because they are jointly distributed. And the things that are uh, measuring one and the same property in different contexts, we call them connections. I already mentioned that term. So they are kind of, uh, the, term, the intuition behind the terminology is that these are kind of isolated islands and they are being connected by the virtue of measuring one and the same thing. So it's connection in that sense. So, uh, and uh, what, we, uh, what we want to see is whether we can find a coupling for, for this system. Now this system is not a random variable. So all six random variables are not jointly distributed. However, if you find the coupling, then all six should be jointly distributed, which means that they should be representable as functions of one and the same random variable S, right? Uh, now, we want to find this coupling. Now, this coupling always can be found for any system like that, right? So, there is never a problem of finding a coupling. There is always a problem of finding coupling subject to certain constraints. What are the constraints? The constraint is that I want this connection here, S, uh, measurement of the of the property one in two contexts. I want this to be to, to be coupled in such a way that the probability with which these two are equal to each other is maximal possible. And the same here, the same here. So for each of the connections, I want maximal coupling. Right? And then I'm looking at the possibility of constructing overall coupling such that its subcouplings corresponding to the connections are maximal. If such a coupling exists, I say that the system is non-contextual. If it doesn't exist, I say it's completely contextual. This is just a special case of the, of the theorem that I showed you before. This is, in fact, the, uh, um, that linear combination. I mean, four linear combinations, you take the largest of them, and you compare it with this thing. This is n minus 2, where n equals 3, so that's why it is 1. And this part will disappear if the system is consistently connected. Right? In the paper that we published uh, uh, last year in the physical review letters, we actually took a specific experiment uh, uh, that was uh, conducted in order to test the, the KCBS inequality, which is kind of larger version of this one, uh, and, uh, and found out that the experimental data there clearly show that, that this part is non-zero. So we had to take into account in order to give you a contextual uh, So uh, even if, even when, you know, the uh, kind of idealized experiment is such that in the system, the, the system is supposed to be consistently connected. As a rule, it is not. And Andrei Hrenikov has done a lot of work kind of documenting these things. You know, just picking up the protocols of the of the experiments and finding out that consistent connectedness is consistently violated. You know, in in in, in experimental data and usually simply kind of swept under the carpet, kind of uh, considered to be a nuisance thing. Now, with this approach, you don't have to do it. You know, whatever the source of inconsistency, even if it's just experimental error, you simply plug it in, and you still can review contextuality of the experiment. Now, <laughs> let me mention a few properties. The most important property, and that, by the way, is, is the change from 1.0 to 2.0. The most important thing that was lacking in the first version of the, of the contextuality by default is this property, that any subsystem of non-contextual system is non-contextual. Now, with uh, 2.0, we have that thing. In other words, if I have this system and it has a coupling which is multi-maximal, it meaning that you know it satisfies all these properties I stipulated before, so the system is non-contextual. And then I, I decided to drop these three random variables from consideration. Then if I drop the, the corresponding couplings, uh, the uh, coupling random variables, then the, the remaining the <coughs> remaining coupling is still multi-maximal coupling of the remaining system. So it is still non-contextual, right? And this is very important property. Deterministic system is completely non-contextual. This is one, one aspect that uh, we should always be aware of when we speak about things like, you know, the, the nature of the, of the contextuality, probabilistic contextuality is logical, right? There is, there is a pitfall here because 
you know, in logical terms, if you translate logical things into probabilistic, they will go probability zero one things. And those things are, are principally, fundamentally non-contextual, always. The, if you have a, a deterministic system, it forms its own coupling. And therefore, this, and this coupling is by three, for trivial reasons, mass and maximal. So, it is, um, uh, it is a non-contextual system. Uh, so, uh, the, one of the important things that follow from this is that by mixing non-contextual systems, you can easily get a contextual system. So, contextuality often can be a result of mixing rather than uh, the result of kind of genuine individual contextuality. And uh, uh, in physics, perhaps it's not a great consideration because uh, all physicists I talk to assure me that you know all electrons are exactly the same, right? so that there are no individual differences between them. But when you conduct experiments on people, each person can be completely different from another person, and each person can be deterministic system. So you ask me whether I trust Gore, I say yes, and I'm deterministic in the sense that there is no probability with which I will say otherwise. Right? And uh, you ask someone else, and that person says no, again with probability one. But then you mix us, and we create a, a contextual system, possible. Actually, as it turns out, uh, I'm kind of uh, stealing the Rujan show. Um, that, as it turns out, that uh, you know, if you analyze any experiments conducted in psychology, in behavioral science, that claim to reveal contextuality, all of them show zero contextuality, no contextuality in any of the experiments. Whether conducted on a single subject with repeated presentations or averaged across subjects. Okay, and then uh, I would like to skip a few things here, uh, just in order not to tax your, your attention. Um, and uh, what I would like to uh, to um, to uh, kind of explain is um, that the idea of a coupling allows you, in a natural way, to construct a universal measure of contextuality. Now, here I owe this particular construction to my collaboration with Acacia and Gary Ost because they actually used more or less this idea with respect to, uh, to consistently connected systems. So all I've done is just generalized it to general, to, to, to systems of arbitrary nature. Uh, it's also very close to what Samson Abramsky and Adam Bram Brandenburger were doing you know, with, with so-called negative probabilities. So in a sense, it is, uh, uh, you know, I, it is inspired by the existing work, but it, it, it creates a new, a new uh, kind of generality that was absent in the previous approaches. So let's say you have this, uh, this system again, and, it's, it, uh, and you have its coupling. Now, if to find a coupling, now it doesn't matter which coupling, to find a coupling means that you, know, you have these random variables, and for every value of this random variable, every value of this random variable, every value of this, for simplicity, I'm now assuming that they are all discrete, finite number of values, each, each of them. I have a joint probability mass of their co-occurring, right? All, all these values, so all six of them, uh, well, not six of them, but uh, whatever the number here is, you know, seven, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine of them. Uh, there are nine random variables here, you know, for every, uh, for every nine values, you have a joint uh, probability or probability mass. And what is probability or, or probability mass? It means that, uh, uh, it, it means that all of these p's are non-negative and they are summing to one, right? If you found that, you found the distribution, right? Now, <laughs> Suppose that you are allowing this system, this values p to be negative, but still require that they sum to one. Then you create something that in the measure theory is called signed measure, signed measure, or charge. Sometimes it's called also a charge. Uh, and uh, in physics, uh, and and applications to physics, people often say negative probabilities approach. But in fact, it's negative and positive at zero, so it's it's signed measure. Uh, and uh, suppose that you can, uh, you are now asking whether 
the joint distribution here exists like uh, such that S1 is distributed as R1, S2 as R2, and S3 as R3, but these values here are allowed to be negative. Then instead of couplings, you are, you are now looking for so-called quasi-coupling, right? Now, if among these quasi-couplings you can find one in which these p's are all non-negative, then you found a proper couple, right? So it's possible that you only have uh, that you only have quasi-couplings of a particular kind, and there are no proper couplings before that. Now, there is this notion of total variation, and to the notion of total variation very simple. Take every p, which no longer is probability, is the signed measure. Uh, and take its absolute value of it and add all of them, right? Now, if this is a proper measure, then the result will be one, of course, because, you know, absolute value will not change the value. But since they are negative or positive, the value will be greater than one or less than, or, or equal to one, but never less than one, right? So the idea is now that, <coughs> that uh, you are looking for, for a quasi-coupling for every given system you are looking for a quasi-coupling such that the probability with which this equals this is maximal, probability with this equals this is maximal, and, and this is true probability, right? Non-negative probability. This equals this maximum, and so on and so forth. And in addition, of course, it's a coupling, so S1 is the same as R1, S2 is the same as R2, and so on. Can you, can you find something like that, right? Uh, if you found that, then, uh, then among all of these uh, quasi-couplings, there is a theorem that there will be one in which the value of total variation is minimal possible, right? If this minimal possible value of total variation is one, then you have found the proper coupling and the system is non-contextual. If it is greater than one, then the difference between this minimal value of total variation and one is a natural measure of contextuality. The farther it is from one, the more contextuality you have. And this is the last thing that I have in my lecture today. Well, thank you, Andy, for the uh, great talk. I wonder if there are any questions. Yes. Uh, I probably have a stupid question, but my question is, is it connected with psychology somehow? And if yes, how? Well, um, this is a truly interdisciplinary book. Uh, system of random variables can be anything, right? It can be a system of fish eating each other, can be a system of people answering questions, can be a single person sitting in my lab and uh, being uh, you know, asked to, to press the buttons you know, in response to stimuli. Uh, or it can be a you know, system of electrons uh, with spins, you know, your measure of photons or anything like that. So it absolutely doesn't matter what. Do you, do you have a specific problem which you try to solve? Uh, no, uh, not, probably not in, in, in the sense in which you mean. There is a problem of contextuality. What's the problem of contextuality? What's the problem of contextuality to solve? Uh, well, um, in, in classical physics, at least this is the common belief, if you have a system, the responses of which are represented by random variables, this system is always non-contextual. In other words, you do certain calculation, you find non-contextual things. Now, in quantum physics, as it turns out, there are systems where it is not the case. Can now, this is, this is a, a significant fact, right? That, that you can have a contextual system in quantum physics, but you cannot have it uh, for macroscopic systems, right? What, so it is an essential... What's the difference? The what, difference is what, that... What's the meaning which you put in the word contextual? I said, well... Uh, you're asking me to repeat the whole, the whole talk. No, no, <laughs> I, I'm asking you to say it simply. What's the meaning you put in the word contextual? Con uh, contextual uh, Non-contextual. If, if I may, uh, uh, this yeah. might be a longer, uh, longer discussion. Perhaps uh, we can take offline and then take a couple more questions. Federico? Uh, okay. uh, yes, uh, just a comment. Uh, 
let me push on that. At the same time, uh, quantum discordance. Somehow, uh, this code occurs because you are mixing uh, non-orthogonal non uh, vectors in, in, in a state. So, somehow, I think that it should be related with contextuality. Could these measures of contextuality be applied to uh, measuring discordance? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, it can. That's why I'm saying it's a universal measure. I'm not, uh, you know, I have no idea, you know, uh, how significant the result will be. But if you are saying there is a certain type of procedure, either empirical procedure or, you know, an analytical procedure in terms of, you know, how you analyze the data, that leads to, to a system of random variables, and you are interested in whether this system of random variables is contextual or not, then this allows you to find out yes or no, and if yes, also to measure uh, the degree of it. Right? Now, it does not answer the question, what is the physical nature of this coordinate? So, it's not physics. It's not psychology. It is abstract interdisciplinary theory. Mm -hmm. Probability theory. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, we, uh, we have time perhaps for one more question, and then we'll break to Thomas. Sure. Uh, so I was I was wondering if any non-contextual uh, system has a deterministic coupling. Like you can represent all non-contextual things by deterministic systems. Like make a, a no no there are truly probabilistic that are non-deterministic no, and still non-contextual. Oh yes yes yeah uh, uh, you know the coupling cannot be deterministic unless all the random variables within the original system are deterministic. This, you know, individual random variables should preserve their distribution. So if there is a single one in the original system ah, okay. which is non which is non-deterministic, then it should be the same in the coupling. And yeah, I mean uh, you know every every system that let's say you know does not violate Gelsenic rules is 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 non-contextual and at the same time it is not deterministic. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, but yeah, you see, that's why I mentioned that you know all these different cyclic systems, they have different physical interpretation, right? About EPR bomb, we usually speak in terms of locality and non-locality. About Leggett Gark in terms of you know non-invasive measurements and uh, you know macroscopic realism. Uh, you know, all of these things. But the beauty of this contextuality thing is that it is universally applicable to all of them. And it is not just an application of the term. Each of these things, being completely different in physical nature, is a special case of the other one, right? Mathematically speaking, properly. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's remarkable in my opinion, right? When if they are completely different physical like, Question order effect is cyclic systems of, of rank two. It is a special case of legged guard system, right? One is in quantum physics and one in psychology. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, I'd like to thank Eddie again for this great talk. And, uh, we can now have our coffee. <laughs>